By 1872, the Republicans had made significant reforms, starting with the 13th Amendment in 1865, ending slavery. You follow that up with the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing equal protection under the law. You can't have things like the Black Codes. Uh, you add on that the Reconstruction Act, essentially. The Republicans had taken everything that uh, Johnson had done in the South, ripped it apart, gotten uh, Confederates out of the voting process, included blacks in the voting process, first with the Reconstruction Act, then officially with the 15th Amendment, managed to take over all state governments, the presidency, the Supreme Court, both houses of Congress, Republicans are dominant. There had been opposition in the South from those paramilitary clandestine groups like the KKK and a lot of disorganized violence. But uh, Grant had managed to quiet a lot of that violence with those enforcement acts. It seems like the United States is on this trajectory for continued reform. Republican Party dominant by this point. The Republican Party's gone way past its anti-slavery roots. And it's now this reform party, this major reform party, and in particular uh, bringing reform in uh, racial areas, uh, and in particular bringing rights to blacks in the South. Again, a number of black members of Congress, members of uh, the state legislatures, things like that. Well, 1872, we're going to start to see something, I shouldn't say start, it's something that had been brewing but it's really going to start hitting in 1872. What's essentially going to happen is the Republicans are going to drop the ball on Reconstruction. And it's not entirely their fault because it just may be a, a product of democracy in general. But we'll start to see splits in the Republican Party. And a lot of what it's going to happen is what happens whenever you have one party rule. If you get one party rule, which essentially we have at the time, only party in town's Republican Party. They're still Democrats, but they're uh, either not able to vote in the South or uh, the minority in the North. What's going to happen is we're going to start to see a split in the dominant Republican Party. This starts in 1872. What you start to see is a number of Republicans start calling for an end to Reconstruction. And in particular, there's going to be this branch of the Republican Party called the Liberal Republicans. They're going to say hey, maybe we should start bringing this Reconstruction, these reforms to an end. Maybe we should start to focus on something else. Now, this liberal Republican opposition to the radical Republicans, people like Grant, they're going to have a couple reasons for wanting to bring Reconstruction to an end. Some think that the Republicans have gone too far. We talked about uh, the Enforcement Acts, suspending habeas corpus, taking people out of uh, one area to be tried for a crime, putting them in another area, uh, banning masks in public, things like that. Some Republicans are going to say, I, d I think those measures might be unconstitutional. We're sort of stretching the constitutionality of things. I don't like that we're doing that. Uh, we're, we should be abiding by the Constitution. This is going a little too far. Others think, you know, hey, these radicals are getting too radical. Now, what, what always happens with political parties, you have one uh, group on the fringe here, group on the fringe here. Well, there'd be some members of the Radical Republicans talking about seizing property uh, from former slaveholders, uh, distributing this to former slaves, distributing it to the government for taxation purposes. Uh, some had been talking about civil rights reforms that would make sense for us today, but back then people would think it's too radical. So some liberal Republicans thought, the radical Republicans are going too far. This is too far, too fast. Um, another thing is that some Republicans and the American public in general starts to think, hey, haven't we done everything we're going to get done? The United States is incredibly good at breaking things. We're really good at making war. We're really good at going in, you know, shooting people, stuff like that. But when it comes to fixing things, a lot of times uh, we're not that great. Um, so, you know, after World War II, I think that'd be the difference. But uh, in a lot of wars, it's we, we break things and then we sort of walk off and, and, uh, and, and don't solve the problems uh, because we have a short attention span. It's sort of a product of democracy. Um, so a lot of people just say, hey, we've had enough reform. We've had this 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Enough is enough. Let's bring this thing to an end. Some people are tired of taxation and reforms. Uh, in order to bring about a lot of this change, 
it, it requires money. You've had the military stay in the South for a long time. Military's continuing to be in the South. You saw an increase with the Ku Klux Klan violence. You'd seen an increase with the Reconstruction Act. You have to pay those guys. You also have to pay Freedmen's Bureau officers uh, who are continuing to serve as this sort of liaisons between former masters and former slaves. Uh, you also have building schools as part of the Freedmen's Bureau. You start to provide education for former slaves. That requires money. So you have a lot of spending, fixing buildings, okay? A lot of uh, federal buildings have been uh, destroyed in the South. That requires money. This comes from taxes. And now we'll talk a little bit later about how they're collecting these taxes. But basically, this is money out of people's pockets. Americans don't like taxation. Reconstruction costs money. Some Republicans are getting tired of radical Republicans and these reforms because they want to focus on the business aspect of the Republican Party. When the Republican Party was formed, its main thing was stopping the spread of slavery into the West, into these new territories. Some of these Republicans are going to say, hey, we did that. Not only did we do that, we went beyond, we uh, reformed, uh, uh, gave rights to, uh, freed slaves, gave rights to them. We're done with that part. Let's work on this pro-business thing. You know, we, we had been promising to use the government to uh, encourage business growth. Let's do that. So by 1872, this part of the Republican Party had become so loud, they're actually going to run their own candidate in the 1872 presidential election. Now, you don't need to worry about this, but it's a guy named Horace Greeley. So liberal Republicans, basically they're going to run on the idea that hey, we've done enough, let's bring Reconstruction in, let's stop with taxes, and let's just move on with other parts of our party. Now, the rest of the Republicans, you could call them radical Republicans, are, will say, no, this isn't enough. We need to continue. We need to continue to push for rights. Things aren't equal. They won't be equal unless we continue with reform. So you're going to get this split. Now, what happens in 1872 is that these liberal Republicans, they're going to run their own candidate. Democrats aren't going to even run a candidate. Again, Democrats are still around, but they're uh, not present in the South because uh, th there's restrictions on voting in the South. And in the North, you know, a lot of people are still look at the Democratic Party as the party of secession. These are the guys that led to the Civil War. No way I'm going to vote for a guy whose party essentially killed my son. So the Democratic Party to a lot of Northerners is a no-go. But a liberal Republican, hey, that, that's not a Democrat. Maybe I could vote for them. So what we'll see is that the Democrats won't even run a, a party, but they're going to support Horace Greeley and the liberal Republicans who are going to run against Grant. Now, this is a political cartoon from the time. Uh, you'll see this. This is actually uh, Horace Greeley right there. Um, this is making fun of the liberal Republicans. It basically says, truce, uh, we surrender. Um, so he's basically signaling here to the KKK, Democratic Party, that we're going to go ahead and give up, the, give up, right? So... Uh, again, you have the KKK running in. This would be like the United States. This would be the uh, uh, you know Republican Party. And what you have here is the liberal Republicans, according to this cartoon, allowing the Democrats over, allowing them to turn the cannon against the United States. I, I believe you have here uh, former you know uh, former Confederates, things like that. So hey, go ahead and come on over. Uh, We'll go ahead and let you in. And it says a liberal surrender, anything to beat Grant. Well, the radical uh, Republicans or just the main Republicans under Grant, this is a formidable threat. You're basically taking the Democrats and, and this branch of the Republican Party, you're, you're combining them together. Um, and again, Democrats, especially Southern Democrats, they want this thing, re Reconstruction, over. They're tired of the military in the South. They're tired of uh, black voters and, and black politicians. Uh, so they want these guys out of there. So if the liberal Republicans are calling for Reconstruction to go to come to an end, that's something that they want. So what you'll see is in 1872, the Republicans have this major issue. What do we do here? Do we, um, how do we appease these guys? Because this is going to be a, enough of a threat that Grant might lose the 1872 election. So what Grant will do is he is going to decide to push through this Amnesty Act. And this is almost a measure to appease the liberal Republicans and to sort of push the idea that Reconstruction will come to an end very soon. What the uh, Amnesty Act basically does is it's going to uh, give the voting rights back to 
uh, uh, former Confederates in the South. Now, there'd be some exceptions, but basically uh, former Confederates can have the right to vote. Now, what the thinking here is that if we do this, you know, states with white majorities, North Carolina, Texas, things like that, we may lose those if Democrats get the right to vote. You know, eventually uh, they'll take over the state legislatures and they'll start voting in Democrats in the South. But Republicans will can still control the North and uh, they'll still control states with black majorities like South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama. So we may lose a handful of states here, uh, but we'll still maintain control of most states. So we're appeasing the liberal Republicans by saying this is coming to an end, but we're also... Uh, uh, we're also going to still maintain control of everything. So sort of patching up uh, this ship. Well, this is going to be enough because in 1872, you'll see that Grant uh, in Congress will still remain Republican, although you're going to start seeing Democrats win a, a number of houses in 1872, uh, a couple houses, a couple state legislatures in 1872 because of that Amnesty Act. But, uh, you know, again, this is just going to be one part of what happens. So this split within the Republican Party. Another thing that's going to happen to the Republican Party after 1872 is they're going to start facing heavy criticism over corruption. Now, this is started in Grant's first administration. It's going to continue into his second administration. But what's going to happen with the, uh, the Republican Party is essentially what happens when you have any party uh, gain one party rule. All right, If you have two kids, let's imagine political parties are two kids. Mom comes in, puts down some cookies, and says... Hey, nobody eat these cookies. These cookies are for dessert. You know, leave them there. Now, if you have two kids there, two brothers or rivals or whatever, one goes for the cookie, the other one's going to say, no, that's uh, uh, mom, Bill, Billy's getting the, the cookies or whatever. And they're not going to be able to get the cookies. So if you have two people present, two parties present, the parties are going to be watching one another. Now, if you take one of the parties away, and this is essentially what happens in the late 1860s, 18, early 1870s, you take one of the parties away, the Democrats have become so weak that the Republicans are going to start reaching for these cookies. It's almost natural uh, to do this in, in a uh, one-party system. I mean, you can see examples of this uh, in, in governments today. So what you'll see is essentially the Republicans, because the Democratic Party is so weak, the late 1860s, early 1870s, they'll start reaching into the cookie jar, and you'll see a lot of Republican politicians be caught in corruption. Now, I shouldn't say that this is isolated to the Republican Party because Democrats are going to be caught in corruption as well. It's just that it's going to be harder for them because the Republican Party is so powerful, and, um, and, and again, they're not going to have the opportunities the Republicans are going to have. I think the best example of this is going to happen in Grant's administration. So Grant, I think, you know, is a good person. I think he's, uh, as a president, you know, obviously he does some great things. He oversees uh, the 15th Amendment, implementation of the 15th Amendment, um, a number of reforms. But there is going to be significant corruption in his administration, maybe more so than any president. Now, there's accusations that Grant himself is going to be involved in the corruption. We don't think that's the case, although it's possible. Um, what we think happens is essentially Grant is a poor manager. We think that he appoints a lot of people that he trusts, and then he sort of lets these guys do what they're going to do. He doesn't hold them accountable, doesn't watch them, doesn't monitor them. And a lot of these guys are going to start taking off the top, skimming taxes where they can, uh, skimming money from the American people. The biggest example we're going to see during Grant's administration, I'll give a couple more in a second here, is going to be something called the Whiskey Ring Scandal. All right, so the United States, since the very beginning, or very close to the beginning, one of the ways that they made money was collecting taxes on alcohol, right? So biggest way the U.S. government can make money at this time is import and export duties. They did not have what we have today. So today the government gets us money from us in a couple different ways, but the money that goes to pay for uh, the Army, the money that goes to pay for you know the SEC, the money that goes to pay for federal oversight commissions, the money that goes to pay uh, politicians, all this comes from our pocket, or a good chunk of it comes in the form of income tax. Every time you get a paycheck, the federal government takes a chunk of it. The government takes money from us in other ways, particularly uh, 
uh, import and export duties. So if something comes over from, say, PlayStation comes over from Japan, when it gets to the dock in the United States, they take a percentage of that before it hits the shelves in the United States. U.S. government gives money that way. State governments get it from us. When we buy a candy bar, we have to pay a sales tax. State government's property tax. you got to pay money every year in property tax. But the U.S. government today is income tax, import-export duties, a couple other ways. Back then, they didn't have uh, they didn't have an income tax. I mean, I don't even know if the they had the ability to collect an income tax. Um, you know, people getting paid just in uh, you know here's a couple bucks or whatever for clearing this field. So what they did instead was they basically taxed before certain things hit consumers. So again, import export duty stuff getting the dock. But in the case of alcohol, the government is basically going to collect a percentage of every barrel of alcohol sold. So you have, uh, let's say, and this goes back all the way until the 1790s, you have somebody producing whiskey, okay? So this person produces, distills this grain, creates 100 barrels of whiskey. One of the ways they would do it is they would have a tax collector go out, count the barrels of whiskey, say you owe me 25% for the going price of a barrel of whiskey, and, you know, this guy would then pay the government uh, tax collector money and and the government would then take that money to use for soldiers or whatever US government stuff so that would be one way uh, that we saw uh, collecting another times they would do it is they would collect it from where the whiskey is being distributed out of so if you have all these whiskey collectors distributors uh, or distillers distributing it through one place the tax collector would go there and collect it from this region well one of the biggest places where whiskey distributed out of is St. Louis. Now, the reason for that, think about it. Where does whiskey come from today? Tennessee, a little bit of Kentucky. There's a lot of different reasons for that, historical and things like that. Um, you know, just the environment's good for, for growing certain grains. So it would go through St. Louis because it comes from Tennessee on these rivers, goes down to the Mississippi River, goes through St. Louis, and you're going to have these tax collectors basically when it gets to this distribution center in St. Louis, they would count up the barrels of whiskey and they would get the money. Now, what's going to happen with this whiskey ring, and I'm oversimplifying this, but what's going to happen is you're going to have some of these government tax collectors. So these are guys hired to collect money from these whiskey tax collectors. They're going to go and they're going to basically go to these whiskey distributors and they're going to say, hey, you've got 100 barrels here. I'm supposed to collect 50 bucks from you. That's what the going uh, tax is on whiskey. So why don't you, um, instead of paying me 50 bucks, why don't I just undercount? Why, instead of saying there's 100 barrels of whiskey, why don't I say there's 50? That way you only have to pay $25 in taxes, and then you slide 10 bucks to me. Slide 10 bucks to me. Therefore, you're only paying $35. You're paying less money in total. I'm making a little bit of money. We're both winning. Only person that's losing here is the American public because instead of that extra uh, money going to pay for soldiers, pay for politicians, pay for government programs, it's going into the hands of this whiskey tax collector. So they start doing this uh, under Grant's administration, and they're going to get away with it because some of this money is going to be funneled up to Grant's personal secretary to keep things quiet. This is a guy named Orville Babcock. So Orville Babcock is Grant's personal friend. He'd served with him in the Civil War. Grant needed a guy in his administration, hey, you know, can you help me uh, deal with a lot of different matters, answer personal communications, things like that, um, deal with financial issues. I, I trust you, Orville Babcock. Well, they know Babcock has a lot of sway in Grant's administration, so these whiskey tax collectors, taking some of the money they're skimming off the top, send some up to Babcock and tell him, keep the books closed, make sure nobody looks into this, you know, uh, make sure nobody investigates what's happening. Babcock collects this money and sort of cooks the books, and, and everything goes fine until Grant replaces his Secretary of Treasury. 1874... Grant's Secretary of the Treasury, which is the President's money man, he's going to uh, actually get caught up in a different scandal. When he gets caught up in a different scandal, Grant will have to fire him. Uh, he's going to replace him with a guy named Benjamin Bristow. Now, Benjamin Bristow is legitimately trustworthy. He's Grant got this scandal. Well, he doesn't have this scandal yet, but he's got other scandals going on. 
He knows the American public wants somebody trustworthy. Puts Bre Benjamin Bristow in charge of uh, the Treasury, Secretary of Treasury. Bristow gets in, starts looking, what the heck's going on here in St. Louis? We used to collect a lot more tax from it than we, we are now. He investigates. The media is going to investigate as well. They're going to determine, hey, these tax collectors have been skimming off the top basically robbing the American public. And this huge whiskey ring scandal is going to emerge. It's basically whiskey tax collectors and um, and these whiskey distributors are going to be caught in this tax evasion. And it's going to go, uh, the investigation is going to lead all the way back to Babcock's desk. doesn't lead up to Grant, but it's going to lead to Babcock. And it's going to be very apparent that Babcock is involved in this, this scheme, that he's been getting paid to keep this thing quiet. Well, Grant is going to be asked. So Congress is going to investigate this. They're going to call up Babcock. They're going to be asking about this. And then they're going to call up Grant to ask him, do you trust Babcock? You know, is this guy, is he guilty of what he's guilty of? Well, Grant is going to come up. And in spite of the fact that the evidence points to Babcock being directly involved, Grant is going to say, I don't think so. I trust this guy. He isn't involved. Well, that's great if you're Babcock, Grant's got your back, but if you're the American public, it looks like the president is backing somebody who uh, is obviously skimming off the top, that's obviously corrupt. So this is going to make Grant look corrupt. Now this is, is going to make the Republican Party look bad, and this is, happens right before these 1874 congressional elections. So a lot of people that might be disgusted with the idea of voting Democrat because they're the party of secession, Maybe these guys are better than these Republicans who are obviously corrupt. And Democrats, their whole thing is small government. Some are going to say, if this big government Republicans, this is the, the type of government we get, maybe I'd rather have some small government with these Democrats. So this is going to get some people losing votes. And, and again, this isn't the only, uh, the only uh, scandal under Grant. There's another thing where there are postmasters making up postal routes and saying, okay, we have to deliver to these people in this area, uh, but in reality it's just some guy wanting to give his rich buddy's kid a job uh, in making up routes. Like, nobody actually lives in this region, so this is just a free paycheck for somebody's kid. Uh, there's another thing where supposedly a bunch of new naval ships are set to be built. $15 million or something like that goes towards these naval ships. Naval ships don't get built. Basically, the, they take the money and just enrich themselves. So, again, I think this isn't exclusive to the Republican Party. The Democrats, they're going to do their own corruption, but it's not going to be as extensive because they're not the party in power like the Republicans. So all these things are going to lose the Republicans some votes in 1874, later 1876, and we're going to see the, the Democrats sort of uh, making uh, uh, some headway because of that. So, again, you start seeing the cracks in this one-party Republican rule. Another thing that's going to happen is a financial panic. So 1873, and this happens about every 20 years in the U.S. We have uh, recession, depression, something like that, but just things don't go well. Well, 1873, you're going to have this financial panic. Now, a lot of different reasons for this financial panic. Uh, some think, people think it's that the Republicans uh, are giving out these loans to private companies to build railroads. And instead of uh, building or, or giving out interest-free payments, not even uh, loans in some cases, uh, but giving uh, people these payments to rebuild government buildings, they're not giving the contracts to people that are qualified. They're giving the contracts to people that slide some of the money back to the Republicans. Those people then go say, hey, I've got a government contract bank. I need some money to loan to finish this contract. Can I borrow some money? Banks loan these guys money. Banks don't have any money in the vault. This guy got the contract not because he's good, but because he slid some money back to the Republicans. And now he's not able to complete the job. He's not able to, you know, uh, do what's supposed to be done. Uh, let's say he was m getting an interest-free loan from the government to build a railroad. And then with the plan, mean at the end he makes some money off the railroad. But now he doesn't get build the railroad because he's not good at it. He doesn't pay the government back, doesn't pay the bank back. Nobody, uh, nobody has, bank doesn't have any money to loan out to anybody else. People that put money in the bank, now they don't have, uh, their money's been loaned out to somebody that can't pay them back. A lot of different factors are going to be involved here. Just know the economy will collapse in 1873. And 
this panic of 1873 is going to be blamed on the Republican Party. Partly, it's it's legitimate. There is it, the Republican Party is part to blame for it. But even if they weren't, the American public always blames the party in power for a financial panic. If the economy's bad, people vote for the other guy, okay? And that's going to happen in 1873. So we're going to have this going against the Republicans, 1874, and it's going to continue on all the way until 1876. So, again, split in the Republican Party, corruption, now a financial panic. Something we won't get to talk about maybe a, a little bit later. There's problems in the West that are happening for the Republican Party. Uh, these Indian wars aren't going uh, as well as some Americans would, would hope. There's also going to be other things. The Democrats are going to start to come up with sort of sneaky ways to get back in power. All right. Now, in some places, the Democrats will get in power simply because, you know, now there's places that they can vote like so places like North Carolina uh, white Southern Democrats they're not going to vote Republican um, place like North Carolina with significant white majorities Texas uh, uh, where else would be uh, Virginia things like that they're going to just take over because you know the the white majorities back in power they're going to vote for the Democrats um, but in other areas Democrats are going to start coming up with sort of these methods of, and this isn't anything new, but they're going to be, be become even better at doing this. They're going to start coming up with ways to get people to vote for them that might not vote for them in other ways. Like, uh, for example, you'll sometimes hear about this machine politics, this Tammany Hall in New York. What Democrats will do in New York, Democrats have always been, it's kind of unusual, but they've always been pretty powerful in New York. One of the ways they do this is they'll find people arriving in the United States, these immigrants, start registering them to vote immediately. And, you know, hey, I'll uh, do you a couple favors when you go to the voting uh, booth, vote Democrat, you know, uh, things like that. They'll come up with ways and Republicans are going to do this as well. They'll get people to vote, you know, three different times or something. Somebody comes with a beard, uh, then the next time they, they come with a mustache, the next time come clean shaven. And so the Democrats get three votes. They don't have voter registration cards like we do today. Uh, so they'll do things like that, sort of tricky ways. Uh, you'll also see Democrats do things like um, in places where people would refuse to do, to vote for the Democratic Party, Democrats will run as a third party. They'll basically be a Democrat, believe in small government, believe in ending Reconstruction, but they're going to rename themselves, okay? So let's say you go have a place like Illinois. Illinois, people would be, feel kind of gross, or at least in most area, areas of Illinois at this time, feel gross about voting for Democrats. That's a party of secession. Um, we're here. We're the party of Lincoln. We're Republicans. We don't like what the Republican Party has become. We don't like the corruption, but there's no way I'm voting Democrat. Well, Democrats will basically rebrand themselves as things like the Conservationist Party. I believe that's what this cartoon is depicting. So if you look at this, this is a Democrat, uh, Democrat a jackass, donkey, uh, whatever you want to call it. This would be the, the symbol of the Democratic Party. Um, he's sitting here in a costume. That might be a, representing a Democrat as a, a conservative party member. So this guy that would refuse to vote Democrat goes to the polls. I'm not going to vote for a Democrat. This conservation party, I'll, I might vote for them. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to vote for Republicans because I'm tired of the corruption. But I'll, and I'm not going to vote Democrats because they they were the party of the South, party of the Civil War. But uh, I'll vote for this conservation party. So they'll vote for a third party the second that the election's over. Maybe the party member will stick to being a member of the conservation party. Uh, maybe they'll just go ahead and say, hey, I'm really a Democrat. Ha ha, tricked you guys. So you'll see that uh, Democrats will start uh, to do things like that. So um, this will start to lead to uh, uh, simple things, uh, uh, Democrats gaining power. Other things will be Democrats will start using tricky means to disenfranchise uh, voters and this is going to happen particularly in the south so blacks in the south this time they're not not going to vote for the democratic party uh, party of secession party of slavery so they're not going to vote for them so white southern democrats know that and in places where you have sort of a uh, uh, you don't have a, a significant white majority in the south places like arkansas or something like that uh, what you'll see is 
uh, white voters will do things like uh, hold militia drills to prevent black voters from getting to the polls. So you still have the army in areas of the South protecting black voters. Um, but what if you, let's say you have a black polling place in one location and you have the black part of town, this, this area, well, white uh, Southerners will hold militia drills between this area and this area. Militias go all the way back to early American history. You'd have these militias to deal with uh, attacking Indians or you'd have them there to deal with you know, invading French or later on the British. And they're there sort of as a citizen military. Well, in areas, you know, a lot of these areas, Indians had not been threat for generations. The French have been long gone. The British aren't a threat anymore. But you still hold these militia drills, or at least you're going to start holding them again now, not because there's a real threat, but because it's a way to uh, uh, keep blacks from getting the polls. So you would have voting place here, black part of town here. Black voters, in order to get to the voting place, would have to pass through militia. And, you know, are you going to be willing to go through this uh, white mob with, with guns? Probably not. Now, the military, they're going to be an awkward place because, per the Constitution and per historical precedent, you can hold militia drills, so they're not technically in intimidating black voters. And so, you know, what what are you supposed to do there? So we'll see that type of thing. Now, again, the KKK violence, that's not going to happen um, as after the Enforcement Acts. You, you will so see a little bit more subversive uh, uh, violence, but... Uh, and you'll see these sort of tricky methods like the um, uh, the militia thing. But uh, uh, again, the outright violence will have died down, but it's sort of a trickier way to do things. So this is going to be a problem for Republicans. Uh, you actually look here, this would be a representation of the Republican Party. You see it's starting to, to fall down, southern claims, uh, repudiation. A lot of people, are. this is part of the economy collapsing, uh, reconstruction the Union as it was, this is starting to fall out from under the Republicans. Democratic Party, again, uh, sort of tricking um, tricking people into voting for them. So by, in 1874, Democrats are going to win the control of an, a number of state governments back. Uh, some people in the North that would never vote Democrat because of the corruption, because of maybe a different party name, they'll start voting for Democrats. And by 1876, the Republicans are going to be in trouble. As a matter of fact, it it looks like they might lose the 1876 presidential election. There's actually talk at the time about Ulysses S. Grant running for a third term. Today we have a constitutional amendment saying presidents can only run two terms. That wasn't around. Before Grant, every president had only served two terms because Washington, Jefferson had done it. It was just sort of an unwritten rule, but it wasn't illegal. Some people say to Grant, run for a third term. He decides not to. So in 1876, the, and by the way, I should point out, the, a lot of people are going to say, uh, maybe we shouldn't have Grant because he's so so uh, caught up with this corruption. So instead, the Democrats, or I'm sorry, the Republicans are going to decide to run this guy over here, this sort of Jedi-looking gentleman. His name is Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, Rutherford B. Hayes is not necessarily the most experienced politician. He's uh, he'd been experienced in the Civil War, fought in the Civil War. A lot of these Republicans are. Um, basically, they're intending to get Northern votes. You know, we're the party of the Union. The, the other guys are the party of treason. So one of the reasons they pick him is because, hey, you know, this is a guy who um, is, is, uh, is a war hero. Uh, but probably the biggest me reason they're going to pick Rutherford B. Hayes is because he is honest, okay? So the Republican Party's had all this different corruption. Rutherford B. Hayes has never been caught up in it. He just simply hasn't. He's a very honest guy, um, and he'd never been caught in, in this thing. So basically that's his big qualification, not corrupt. He's an honest man. Another reason, by the way, they pick him is Ohio. So he's from Ohio. So... Some of these states up here, there's some that are still staunchly Republican, particularly up here in the Northeast, but some states, Democrats, again, even in the North, Democrats are making inroads, and you have these swing states. As a matter of fact, New York is, uh, is right on the verge between Republicans and Democrats. Ohio is as well, and these have substantial populations. The way the U.S. Constitution is set up, each state gets a num uh, number of electoral votes, um, so 
Ohio has a significant amount of electoral votes. Whoever wins it is going to win a lot, uh, and it's very close. So we'll pick a guy from Ohio. Um, again, New York is, is another one with a significant amount of electoral votes. It's uh, a swing state. So they pick him because he's from Ohio. So honest guy from Ohio, war hero. Now the thing Rutherford B. Hayes, he's not going to run really on anything, okay? He's not going to say anything about Reconstruction. Why wouldn't he say we're continuing to push for Reconstruction, we're continuing to push for reforms, we think that in order to, you know, have equality in the South, we need to continue with education reforms. He's not going to do that in 1876 because people are tired of it. Again, the American public, now we, we're here uh, 11 years past the Civil War. Obviously, reforms still to be, need to be made, but a lot of Americans are going to say, you know, 11 years, sure, we, we've we solved 250 pr years of slavery and all the issues brought up before that. It's been 11 years. Let's move on. We've got that solved. I mean, that's just the way we do things. We we uh, try to solve uh, long-term problems in the short term. So Hayes actually believes Reconstruction needs to continue, but he's not going to say anything about it. He basically is going to say uh, uh, nothing about Reconstruction. He just keep quiet on it. And the way he's going to run is, we're not the party of treason, okay? We Republicans, we stood for the Union. Democrats, they're the party of treason, okay? So vote for me because I'm not them, all right? So that's how he's going to run. He's going to be run, run against this guy right here. This guy's named Samuel Tilden. Samuel Tilden is from New York, all right? That's actually going to be his big selling point. New York swing state. It's a place where Democrats had started making roads and, you know, Republicans and Democrats are sort of uh, even there. They think, uh, Democrats think if we get this guy from New York, that'll one, bring us New York. And they also think it's going to tell Northerners, hey, Democrats, we're not the party of secession. We're the party of the union. We've given up that secession thing. Look, we're running a guy from the North. Okay. So don't think of us as the Southern party. We're everybody's party. We're just a party of small government. And isn't small government what we what we need right now with what the Republicans have been doing? So Democrats will put up Tilden because of that. They're also going to put Tilden up because he doesn't really have ties to the Civil War. He's a newspaper editor. Um, he's uh, During the Civil War, he didn't serve for either side, so they're not going to upset Southern voters by putting a guy from the North on the ticket, and they're not going to upset Northerners by putting a Southerner or a guy that serves in the Confederacy on the ticket. They're just going to put a guy who's, um, uh, you know, a, a guy that stood out of the Civil War that didn't serve on either side. Now, the thing with Tilden is he had served in New York as the governor for a brief time. He hadn't actually served very long, but during this time, he was notoriously hard on corruption. He cleaned it up. Very honest guy. So Democrats are going to run. We got a northerner here. This northerner is tough on corruption, and they're going to run on the idea of ending Reconstruction. We're going to bring an end to all this reform. We're going to stop this taxes. Uh, everything's going to go back to normal. Reconstruction needs to come to an end. The unions healed. Everything, all these problems solved. So in 1876, we've got Rutherford B. Hayes, honest dude, but he's a member of the party that's known for corruption. Um, he's not really going to be saying much because he knows the American public's tired of Reconstruction, but he's, he's going to be saying, I'm not the party of treason. Tilden's going to argue, yes, Democrats are the party that's of secession, uh, but that's not me. I'm from the North. I didn't serve uh, in the Civil War. I'm tough on corruption, and I'm going to bring Reconstruction to an end. I'm going to stop with all these taxes. So, again, this isn't that far off from the Civil War. It's 11 years since the end of the Civil War. Most Northerners believe that Democrats, you know, party of secession, but they're so upset with what's been happening with the Republicans then when the votes are counted, this is going to be incredibly, incredibly close. And as a matter of fact, Samuel Tilden is just going to be one electoral vote shy. He's going to have 184 uh, of winning. And Rutherford B. Hayes is going to have 165 when the initial votes are counted. So the person that gets 185 electoral votes is going to win. But there's actually three states 
uh, some issues in a couple other states, but I'm focused on three states where the votes are going to be so close that recounts are needed. Now, before we talk about these three states, which are Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, these other southern states, if you look at them, Tilden wins in this. This shows how this disenfranchisement, uh, sort of the sort of trickery and, and this type of thing, has already gotten Democrats back in power, even in black majority states in Alabama, Mississippi. So now white Southern Democrats are back in charge here. And uh, again, the the, uh, Amnesty Act allows uh, white Southern Democrats to vote. But places where you still have Republicans in the South control, Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, these are going to be the three states where the vote is too close to count uh, on initial count. And these three Republican-controlled states are going to be basically in a position to swing the election. So let me just put it this way. So initially votes are counted. Tilden has 184. If he wins any of these three states, he's going to win the presidency. If uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, in order for him to win, he has to win all three to become the president. The initial count in all these is too close to count. So what's going to end up happening is there's going to be a recount in these three states and the state government is going to conduct the recount. These three state governments are those that are still controlled by Republicans, where you hadn't had the sort of falling apart of the Republican Party, hadn't taken hold completely in these areas just yet. Well, what's going to happen is what you can kind of imagine happen, is basically the Republicans will count up and they'll say, Rutherford B. Hayes won all three, okay? Corruption. That's basically what happens here. Tilden may have won these states, or probably won some of these states. Before I should point that out, though, Rutherford B. Hayes might have won Alabama, Mississippi, might have won some of these states, but Democrats are doing corruption here as well, intimidating black voters, things like that. So it's corruption on both sides, but it's going to be most notable in these three states because of the uh, it happens to be so close in these three states, and these are the ones that Republicans are still controlling in 1876. So when this recount comes back, it basically is going to throw the presidency to Rutherford B. Hayes. Well, if you're a Democrat and you're used to, and by the way, you should, before you look at this, uh, continue on, look at this. Democrats are winning in Connecticut. Democrats are winning in New Jersey, uh, Indiana. Northern states are voting for the party of secession because people are tired of Reconstruction. People are tired of... Uh, 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 the corruption with the Republican Party. Well, when this happens, there's going to be a huge outcry from the public. This is fraud, okay? This is Republicans have just thrown the vote t- towards Hayes. He didn't really win these three states. It's just because the Republican Party controlled these three states. And there's going to be talk of, from the Democrats, who I should point out, won the majority of the popular vote. This is the time when they won the majority of the popular vote. Now, again, showing just how much the Republican Party fell in a couple of years. Now they're going to be saying, we've got, we're going to, uh, we're not going to let this stand. This is corruption. So what you're going to see in 1877, just before Rutherford B. Hayes takes the presidency, is the Republican Party is going to make a deal with the Democratic Party. And this is sort of under the table. You'll sometimes hear this called the bargain of 1877. What happens is the Republicans will say to the Democrats, um, if you allow Rutherford B. Hayes, if you accept the results of this election, allow Rutherford B. Hayes to be president, we're going to remove the military from the South. All right? So we're going to take the military out of the South. I want you to think about this. The military had been there since the end of the Civil War. It had especially been there in large numbers since the Reconstruction Act to protect black voters. Numbers had bumped up during the Enforcement Acts to prevent groups like the KKK uh, violence against uh, Republicans and, and blacks in the South. The Republicans say here with 1876, uh, this bargain of 1877, if you accept Rutherford B. Hayes as president, we'll take the military out of the South. What do you think they're saying to the Democratic Party here? All right, you've started making these steps. You're starting winning back the South. The only thing keeping you from completely dominating the South is the fact that we have black enfranchisement, that we're blacks are allowed to vote. And the only thing that's allowing blacks to vote is the military. If we take the military out, 
this intimidation can start kicking up uh, and this is going to prevent black voting. You can almost see this as Democrats, you can have the South back. If you accept Rutherford B. Hayes as president, we'll leave the South. We'll stop protecting black voters. You can have this back. The Democrats are going to agree to this. Rutherford B. Hayes will win the 1876 presidential election. He'll take over in, in uh, March 1877. So Republicans win there. But what we're going to see from this point forward is essentially Reconstruction comes to an end. The reforms are going to come to an end. The Democrats will regain control of the South. We had this period where you had black voters and you had uh, black politicians in the South. That's going to come to an end, and we're going to see, and this isn't going to happen immediately. Some states had already happened by, by uh, uh, 1874, as a, for example, Democrats had regained control of Texas. They wrote a new state constitution for Texas, got rid of the Reconstruction one in, uh, uh, before. But we're going to see this happen with other states once the military goes out. White Southern Democrats are going to regain control. And what we'll see is once they regain control, we're going to have essentially them put in place measures so they don't lose control again. Okay, so these areas had already turned Democrat. What we're going to see after 1877 is even these areas and other areas, uh, pretty much areas of black majorities, white Southern Democrats are going to regain control because the military is no longer there to put, protect black voters. All right, what's going to happen a lot of people are going to say is uh, this is the end of Reconstruction and what's going to happen to uh, blacks in the South. Some people argue is worse than slavery. OK, what we'll see is that Southern uh, Southern white Southerners will start taking white Southern Democrats will take over the various uh, houses in the South. And when they get in, they're going to take these constitutions that were, were written post Reconstruction Act. So the st each state government. 1868 wrote these new state constitutions. Uh, they're going to write these. Uh, uh, so they wrote these 1868, 69, 70. Um, when white Southern Democrats are going to come back in, they're going to basically do what the Republican governments had done to Andrew Johnson's uh, state constitutions. They're going to rip them apart. So I'm going to give you Texas wrote a new constitution, 1865. Uh, it got ripped up 1870. It's going to get ripped up again, 1874. Uh, and these new state constitutions are going to be written. South Carolina is going to be written a little bit later. But when these new state constitutions get put in place, you're going to see that they're going to emphasize certain things. So these new white Southern Democrat written state constitutions, they're all almost going to have very small government, very small government. It's going to be uh, almost word for word. We're, we're going to limit the power of government. The reason for this is that a lot of white Southern Democrats view that period of Republican rule from 1867 to uh, you know 1877 in some states, a little bit earlier, a little bit later in other states, as being tyrannical. They basically say Republicans brought corruption, taxation. It was too much government for us. So they're going to write in, in these new state constitutions. Even though they're now in control, they're basically going to say, we don't want that to ever happen again, so we're limiting power in the state government. For example, in Texas, the state constitution, the constitution we still live under today, uh, basically says state legislature only meets once every two years. Very limited power in the governor's house because they didn't, white Southern Democrats didn't like what happened uh, during the period of Republican rule. These new uh, state constitutions, almost to a T, they're also going to say lower taxes. We don't like taxes. We thought the taxes under the Republican uh, governments were, were too much. So small government, low taxes. The other thing you're going to see with these new state governments is that they're going to, and the laws that are going to come shortly after them, is that they are almost to a T going to, well they all are going to, I shouldn't say almost to a T, to a T, they're going to find ways to limit black participation in voting. All right, so beginning in, uh, again, as we talked about, Reconstruction Act 67 uh, until, you know, the uh, 1877, we'd had uh, black voters, black politicians, mixed obviously with white Republican politicians. Well, when white Southerners get back in charge, they're going to put in place measures to make sure to limit that and prevent that from happening again. 
but they have to do it in ways that doesn't uh, subvert or, or doesn't violate the 15th Amendment of the Constitution guaranteeing the right to vote based on race, color, and previous servitude and ways to do it without um, uh, violating the 14th Amendment. We're going to see these new state governments limit black participation in government and uh, put in place measures to, again, uh, almost put blacks in a subservient position with, while still getting around those, those new amendments. So how are they going to do this? Well, and by the way, this isn't historical uh, interpretation. This is fact. At these new constitutional conventions, when they meet to throw out the Reconstruct Act and Constitution, uh, Reconstruction Act constitutions, they will specifically say, how can we limit black participation in politics without, I mean, they s seriously say that. You have minutes from these things. How can we do it without violating the 15th Amendment, these new constitutional amendments? Well, what you're going to see in almost all of these southern state governments is things like poll taxes. All right, so states determine who can vote in local elections, who can vote in, or state elections, who can vote in federal elections. Who votes for president, that's up to a state. Today, some states say felons can't vote. Um, hypothetically, state governments could say clowns can't vote. Today, you cannot, states can't take away the right to vote because of the 15th Amendment, race, color, previous servitude, and because of this other amendment we're going to talk about, 19th Amendment, they can't take it away from sex. That one comes later. But they can't take it away for race, color, previous servitude, but they can take it away for other things. So what all these southern states are going to do, and all the politicians in these southern states, these, these uh, newly uh, returned white southern Democrats, they're going to say, how do, we, how, do we, how do we do this without, without violating that 15th Amendment? We can't take it for race. Well, most black people are still poor. Again, you were property 1865. Even 10 years later, that's not enough time to earn generational wealth. So blacks are traditionally poorer than whites. Why don't we make people, people pay to vote? That means that people with no expendable cash, which is the majority of blacks in the South, they're not going to be able to vote. So what we'll see is the state governments start passing poll taxes where it requires people to pay to vote. And a lot of times these things will be compounding. Like if you don't are voting age, you don't vote in one election, pay a dollar for the poll, then next one you got to pay two dollars. If you don't do that one, next one you got to pay four dollars, things like that. So they're going to start requiring people to pay to vote because they know the majority of blacks can't afford to do this. Some whites can as well. These poll taxes are going to be put in place. This is going to disenfranchise poor whites as well as poor blacks. Um, so this is going to be one way to disenfranchise uh, black voters. Another thing, and this again, they specifically say this uh, to, di to disenfranchise blacks, they're going to start putting in place literacy tests. Now, during Reconstruction, we'd seen a number of blacks learn to read and write. Uh, some had attended those schools set up during Reconstruction, but still that was a small percentage. And again, during slavery, uh, whites are specifically not allowed or not taught blacks to read and write. So you have this very illiterate population. The only way you can get literate is if you continue to support public schools, things like that. But that's not going to happen, and we'll talk about that more in a second. So if you have a illiterate population, if you make a literacy test where you have to require people to answer certain questions in order to be able to vote, then that's not going to allow a literate population to vote. And by the way, I should point out, I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea to make people pass certain tests to be able to vote. Because if you don't understand the government, I, you know, maybe you shouldn't be able to vote. But if you take away education from somebody, you don't give them the ability to learn the literacy test, don't give them the opportunity to do that, you're pretty much saying you're not allowed to vote and then your children aren't going to be allowed to vote because they're, you're not going to be able to put, in, you're not going to be able to put in place measures that are going to give them the opportunity to learn what they are able to, or need to know to be able to vote. So we'll see these literacy tests be put in place. Again, predominantly instituted for blacks, um, but they're going to be, uh, affect whites as well, some whites as well. Another thing you'll see in these states is the way the party system in the United States works is each party puts up their own candidates. So you hold these uh, primaries sometimes. So like people in the state of Texas will uh, vote for 
Democrats will hold a vote for whoever they're going to run for president, whoever they're going to run for governor, stuff like that. Well, Democratic Party's not a government party. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the Democratic Party private party will, will specifically say, we're not going to allow blacks to vote. And if you're in a, in a white majority state where pretty much all whites are Democrats, you're not going to get a say in who the dominant uh, candidate is. So we'll see uh, blacks prohibited from primary voting. Uh, voter intimidation. Even in states where the blacks can pay the poll tax, you will still have a population of literate, um, fairly wealthy blacks in, in some areas of states. In those instances, hey, the military's gone now. Let's prevent this guy from getting uh, to the polls by having the police or something set up around the black area with guns, intimidating these black voters. So these intimidation will be working as well. So it's these legal means and also extra legal means. I'm going to give an example of one uh, illegal mean or legal mean that is implemented. So the state of Louisiana, 18, so they put in place poll taxes, they put in place literacy tests, but you still have a number of black voters in, uh, in, uh, by the 1890s, uh, even with literacy tests in the, in the poll tax. So Louisiana, controlled by white Southern Democrats by that point, they're going to put in place a law that says in order to be able to vote, you have to read and write, have $300 in property. Again, that right there is going to eliminate 90% of the, the, the black population from voting. But they will add on to that that you have to have a relative that voted prior to 1867. So let me just be clear. The reading and writing, that's going to eliminate a significant portion of the black population. $300 in property, that's going to eliminate even more. You have to have a relative that voted prior to 1867. That does not specifically say you can't vote based on race, color, or previous servitude, because it, it doesn't. It's, it's a date. But how many blacks had a voter or had a relative that voted prior to 1867? None. I mean, you know, maybe if you have a white relative or something like that, but... If, if you're black, you couldn't vote before the Reconstruction Act. So that essentially eliminates black voters without specifically saying black. So you're going to see laws like that throughout the South. Um, this is going to be one of these measures once white Southern Democrats gain control of the South. Other things, uh, 13th Amendment says you cannot take away a person's freedom, keep them in slavery, unless it's punishment for a crime. Uh, we're going to see a number of, uh, well, you know, obviously we're going to be rightful convictions, but there's going to be a significant amount of wrongful convictions for the purpose of uh, essentially creating workers. Uh, the state of Texas, for example, there's uh, the prison system's going to increase dramatically. The number of convictions against blacks is going to increase dramatically from reconstruction time to post-reconstruction time. Uh, and, and what we'll see is t state of Texas will then take black convicts, start leasing them out to private companies. Sugarland, Texas, that was a big deal. Uh, so if the 13th Amendment says you can't keep people as slaves unless it's punishment for a crime, then uh, we're going to uh, increase the number of people that are punished for a crime. So you're going to see the black prison population increase substantially. Another thing you're going to see post-reconstruction uh, post, uh, uh, is segregation. Before the Civil War, Slaves were in their area, you know, you had whites in their area. There wasn't really segregation as it, because, I mean, there was segregation based on master-slave relationships, but there wasn't segregation as far as government's concerned or restaurants, almost because there didn't have to be because it's property-master relationship. But what you see after 1876, 1877, is that Democrats are going to start passing segregation laws and private businesses are going to start putting segregation laws in. So you'll have restaurants, there weren't even very many restaurants you, you'd call back then, but private businesses, whereas before bars, hotels, things like that, you wouldn't have to dictate whether, you know, this is only for whites only or blacks only just because it was almost assumed. White businesses will start putting up post-reconstruction, we're only serving whites here. Now, that's a private business. That's not the government, so it doesn't violate the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment says, you know, uh, you, you can't do it based on race, color, previous servitude. 
Well, we'll actually see state governments do the same thing in city governments and, and county governments. What they'll start doing is saying, we're going to have separate schools for whites and blacks. It's almost like this, this thing, we can't take away the rights because of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, but we don't have to live by blacks, okay? So what you'll start seeing is separate facilities set up. Uh, so hospitals, uh, uh, well, hospitals are private for the most part, but things like uh, schools, courthouses, things like that. So um, if you're, let's say, county of uh, Wise County or something like that, Wise County, post-14th uh, post Amendment, 14th Amendment says if you, you can't pass laws based on a certain race and if you're providing government facilities, you cannot take them away based on race. So what Wise County will do, and I'm sorry I'm picking on Wise County, but uh, what they'll say is, all right, 14th Amendment says we have to provide government facilities to people regardless of race, but it doesn't say we can't provide two different facilities. So we'll set up one school here, one school here. This will be the school for whites. This will be the school for blacks. We're just going to have them be segregated. Okay, so you'll start seeing this sort of get around to the 14th Amendment. We're providing the facilities. We're providing the money, but we're just doing it in separate areas based on race. So this starts to happen post-Reconstruction South, these Jim Crow laws. They'll get bigger, and we'll talk about them a little bit more uh, towards the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. But they start in this post-Reconstruction era. It's going to actually get to the point where... It's going to get to the point where... Uh, it's going to get to the point where... Um, it's going to get to the point where um, uh, state governments will start to institute uh, or require private business to actually segregate. And again, this is going to be Democrat-run, Democrats part, party of small government. But what you'll see in the 1890s is actually, uh, for example, the state of Louisiana, they'll say to private train companies, so these are train cars, that if you're providing services to the general public, you have to provide separate train cars for white and black citizens. So this is the state government telling a private business you have to provide these separate train cars. So this isn't the company making this decision. This is the state making this decision. Now, you can't do this uh, for interstate trains because they cross interstate lines. But if you're talking within the state, an interstate commerce clause of the U.S. Constitution prevents you from doing that. We'll talk about that more later. But if you're talking about a train for a city or a train within a state, uh, you know, you can do this. So what you'll see is a lot of black leaders, basically, and whites, you know, people that are reform Republicans who don't like what's sort of uh, this move away from the reform uh, part of their party, they'll start to challenge th these type of laws and basically say these things violate the 14th Amendment. And the way you challenge those type of laws within the United States is you, uh, you bring them before the Supreme Court. And we're going to see this happen in uh, the 1890s, after Louisiana passes this law saying, hey, you have to, if you're a private train company, you have to provide separate facilities for whites and blacks. Uh, these uh, concerned citizens in 1892 in Louisiana uh, will decide to challenge this in court. And the way they're going to do this is they're going to get this guy right here. This guy's name's Homer Plessy. Now, the deal with Homer Plessy is he is a uh, part African, so African-American. He's one-eighth black, um, seven-eighths white. So his grandmother, great-grandmother uh, was black. But by all appearances, if you saw Homer Plessy walking down the street, you had to identify him, you would say he was white. So appearance-wise, he's white. But per Louisiana's train car law, he is um, going to be black because they said anybody with African ancestry has to sit in a separate chain, train car. So what these citizens in New Orleans will decide to do is to send Homer Plessy onto a train car to challenge this law because they're hoping he gets arrested, then they can challenge the Constitution of the law. So in 1892, Homer, Homer Plessy will board a train car, and 
He's going to enter the white section. Train car ticket taker is going to allow him in because Homer Plessy looks white. And Homer Plessy, before he sits down, he's going to say to the train car collector, I'm black. I have black ancestry. Well, the train car collector now is going to say to, to Homer uh, Plessy, well, that means you have to go sit in this separate train car. Uh, Homer Plessy is going to refuse to do so. He's elected for arrested for trespassing. Well, Homer Plessy will then challenge this ruling in court. When he challenges this ruling in court, it's going to go to uh, first uh, New Orleans court, then it goes to uh, the Louisiana State Court. They rule that he violated the law. He was trespassing. Well, Plessy will then appeal this up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is going to hear this case, and they're going to have to determine, does this law violate the 14th Amendment? Again, the 14th Amendment says you can't uh, pass laws specifically per race. You have to provide equal protection under the law, so this violate it. Well, the Supreme Court is going to make a ruling here in this Plessy B. Ferguson. Uh, uh, Ferguson, I believe, is the owner of the train company. What they're going to rule is that this law doesn't violate the 14th Amendment, and neither do um, separate schools, separate government facilities, because they, they require within the law that separate facilities be provided by for blacks and so they're going to make this broad ruling saying that it's okay to have segregated facilities as long as the segregated facilities are equal so wise county you can set up a separate school for blacks as whites as long as the black facility is equal to the white facility you can require train cars to have separate cars as long as you're requiring them to have the train cars be equal. Now, this establishes this separate but equal, uh, the separate but equal ruling, which is basically going to tell Southern governments that have already started this segregation, it's okay to continue this. It's okay to segregate as long as everything's equal. Now, you know, obviously you'd like to think that everything would be integrated and that'd be great, but if you had segregated things were equal, I mean, that wouldn't be as, as awful as what we're going to see. But the thing is, the Supreme Court, when they make that ruling, how can they possibly enforce this, okay? So if you say everything is fine to segregate and it's fine to separate as long as you provide equal facilities, who's there to check if things are equal? The Supreme Court doesn't have anybody to do this. The national government, as we're going to see, they're not necessarily interested in Reconstruction anymore. State governments post-1876, 1877, they're controlled by white Southern Democrats. They're not going to check this. County governments are controlled by white Democrats. Uh, the city governments are. They're not going to check this. So what's going to happen instead that is separate but equal is going to be ruled on paper, but it's never going to be se separate but equal. What will almost always happen is that we'll see city governments, state government, county governments, when they set up separate facilities, they're going to provide more money, more uh, revenue, more uh, manpower, labor, things like that, to the white uh, the white facilities than they will the black facilities. So basically the Supreme Court says you're not violating the 14th Amendment if you have separate but equal, but separate but equal is never going to be equal. And what we'll see is black schools will not be provided nearly as many facilities, teachers. You'll see schools uh, like this is a, a picture of black school, whereas the white school would probably have, you know, um, uh, a third as many students or, or less per teacher, um, you know, bigger classrooms, better budget, that type of thing. So we're going to start to see this segregation occur post-Reconstruction. Another thing you're going to see is an increase in de facto segregation in the South. And this one had been going on, obviously, during Reconstruction. But one of the things about Reconstruction is you didn't have that much economic turnover. People that were slave owners lost their property and slaves, but those guys probably own more land than everybody. So they still have the capital. They still have more money, more wealth than anybody else in the South, even though they're down a lot of slaves. Slaves, uh, now you're free. Now you're not a slave any longer, you, but you were property. You don't even own the shirt on your back because that's the guy um, who, who used to work for. Now it technically owns uh, your clothes, even though they don't own you. So now you're basically thrown out on your own. Sure, the Freedom's Bureau has helped you get a job, you've earned a wage, but still you don't have this wealth of this other guy here. So whites basically are controlling the money and the wealth in the South. And what we're going to see as, as a result of this is this wealth disparity 
and the gap's not going to be able to close because there are no programs to put in place to close this gap and you're actually going to see the gap widen post reconstruction you can see this in you know so de jure segregation would be government segregation what de facto segregation would be which is basically public uh, or segregation or racism is probably what I should say uh, what you'll see is let's say a white owner has a uh, white guy has a, a a fence that needs to be built well you have two carpenters come to you one white one black say both equal skills maybe even the black guy has better skills than the white guy and uh, but if you're the white owner just because of the sort of the racism that's been built up by these uh, 250 years of slavery not really solved during reconstruction you're probably gonna hire the white carpenter instead of the black carpenter just the way it's gonna be and this is gonna mean that this wealth isn't gonna go into the hands of blacks so they're gonna remain again uh, continue to be poor so this is going to problem is going to exacerbate post reconstruction. You add on to that, there's going to be an increase in what you would call terrorism uh, post reconstruction. Okay, now this obviously happened dur during reconstruction with the KKK uh, and things like that. But as we talked about, the Republicans had come in, Enforcement Acts sort of quelched that. But once the military leaves the South in 1877, there's not anybody to police this this violence against blacks. So what we're going to see an increase of is not not the type of violence that we see in almost everyday life where, you know, somebody that robbing or somebody, you know, uh, getting in a fight over a girl or something like that. I mean, that type of stuff happens with humans. What you're going to see is a type of violence increase in the South post-Reconstruction that I don't know how to explain it. It's not natural and it's not something you really see in American history. I mean you can go back and maybe to the Salem witch trials or maybe go uh, to Europe see that kind of stuff happening but it's not it's not something that happens in the US. It's, it's and even terrorism isn't the right word but you're gonna see an increase in things like lynching post reconstruction. You're gonna see an increase in the type of violence where you know, it's not just to punish the other person. It's not just to fight the other person. It's it's to belittle the other person and to sort of push them down. What I what I kind of think happens uh, uh, is basically it's almost like Southerners got beat up during the Civil War. You know, you're fighting the North, you lose, you sort of get your face shoved in the ground. You know, you have this little bit with Johnson. You, you get sort of back in power then, but then. Uh, Congress comes in, sort of pushes your face down uh, into the mud. You get beat up, you get humiliated. But after 1877, the military leaves the South, but blacks are still in the South. Well, what I think happens is that white Southerners are humiliated. And again, this is psychological. I could be completely wrong. This is my explanation. I don't know if uh, other people look at it this way. But it's almost a humiliation. You can't get back at Northerners, you can't get back at the people that did this to you because they're all the way up there. You know, you face this sort of disenfranchisement. Uh, and again, you, even if you could, you, you lost in the war. But you do have a group of people, blacks here in the South, that were part of sort of this, uh, you know, subordination of you. And I think what's going to happen is almost like this mental philosophy that we've got to get back at somebody. So what you'll see is this increase post reconstruction of this almost horrific violence that you really don't see in any part of American history things like lynching so if somebody a blacks accused of a crime um, a lot of times white mobs before the person can face trial for their crime will break into a jail kill the person before they face trial and a lot of times these killings will happen in a pretty grotesque manner I'll tell you what I'm just gonna give you an example I think this will illustrate it. So this picture right here is a picture of a guy named uh, Henry Smith. Henry Smith's the guy up there on the scaffolding uh, tied up in the middle there. Henry Smith uh, was from Paris, Texas, it's just a little bit up, up the road from me. Uh, well, Henry Smith, former slave, um, after, uh, after the end of uh, slavery, 1865, uh, he started to become a handyman. Uh, started to work, you know, basic fencing, that type of thing. Just a guy that would do odd jobs. Now, all reports are Henry Smith probably was not a good human being. He, uh, known alcoholic, you know, he, uh, 
uh, supposedly was a ne'er do well going about town, you know, caused a lot of trouble. Probably not the best uh, best person. And he's probably going to commit this crime that he's going to be accused of. So what happens in 1893 is the uh, sheriff of the town uh, hires Henry Smith to repair a fence. He basically hires Henry Smith to repair a fence, do some odd jobs around his house. Henry Smith, while he's doing this, uh, the, the sheriff's daughter disappears. Uh, she's later found murdered. It's almost certain that Henry Smith did it. He's probably committed the crime and probably should have faced a trial, probably should be, you know, face punishment for this crime. But that's not what's going to happen to Henry Smith. Instead, he's going to be arrested. And uh, instead of facing a trial like you're supposed to per the Constitution, um, what's going to happen to him is the girl's father is going to take Henry Smith and he's going to call his brother and uh, he's going to call the, the little girl's brother, his son, and he's going to tie Henry Smith up on this scaffolding. And so you see the scaffolding here. I believe this is Henry Smith's father, or I'm sorry, the girl's father. This would be uh, uh, her uncle, and I believe this would be her brother. Uh, and what they're going to do is they're going to tie Henry Smith up, and they're going to basically, before they do this, they're going to make this announcement and say, hey, we're about to execute this guy. 10,000 people are going to show up to witness Henry Smith be executed. And over the course of an hour after this crowd shows up, what the father's going to do is he's going to take this hot coal oil, and he's basically going to heat up the poker and this, this burning oil, and he's going to start poking Henry Smith's body with it. Starts poking with him with it. Uh, Henry Smith is going to be begging to die after a while because the pain's so intense. Uh, he starts screaming, and at that point, uh, Henry Smith's, uh, I'm sorry, the, the girl's father is going to take a hot poker, shove it down Henry Smith's throat, and basically burn his esophagus and his ability to scream. So Henry Smith is starting to essentially uh, die of this, this uh, inhuman pain, but he re holds on to life. And it's after over an hour of this torture that, the little girl's father is going to pick up the the bowl of hot coal oil, and he's eventually going to pour it over Henry Smith's head. At this point, Henry Smith uh, will start to let light on fire. His fat from his body will start to melt. Uh, this is going to fall to the bottom of the scaffolding, and then the scaffolding is going to break. Henry Smith's body will fall to the bottom of the scaffolding, and what's going to come around is uh, people from the crowd will then run up to Henry Smith, start grabbing fingers from his body, um, teeth, things like that as souvenirs. So this is a man that just got executed. Now, I'm not here to criticize the girl's father, uncle, brother, the family members, because I don't know. I don't know what I would do in that same situation. You know, that's between them and, and their God. That's, that's, that's whoever, that's their business. I, I don't know how I would react. The thing that I'm I think makes this significant, and this is going to make the, all these type of lynching significant, is these people. You know, why would 10,000 people show up to watch a person get tortured? This doesn't happen, it really, up to this point, this doesn't happen in American history. Why would this guy travel two hours in a horse and buggy to watch a man get killed? What's his motivation? Why, why would he do that? Again, I think it might be this mentality of, we'll show you. I, I don't know for sure, but uh, I, I think that that might be the case. Now, something I should point out, th this is not going to be something that happens on a regular basis. So about 5,000 people are going to be lynched in the South from 1865 to 1970. Statistically, that's not very many. It's, you know, I'm off the top of my head, 1 to 100,000 people. But it, I don't know if it has to be that many because let's imagine that Henry Smith is your uncle or he's your you know, son, or he's your, you know, uh, a father, something like that. This is going to stick with you. I mean, it, it really is. And, and this sort of is, it's it's a method to keep, you know, uh, people down. And, it, and it's actually going to be effective because if you know that sort of stepping out of line, according to uh, uh, white Southerners, will result in this, that's going to be a, a very intimidating factor. So, um uh, Again, I, I don't, I don't want to make it, it seem like this happened all the time, but when it did happen, it's incredibly, uh, in, it could be incredibly, incredibly vicious. And this, obviously, this is a, a horrible example, but there are plenty of equally horrible examples as well. All right. So with all these factors combined, disenfranchisement, again, you can't improve the situation if you can't vote. 
segregation. If you get e uh, less than equal facilities, you don't get equal education, uh, you can't pass that literacy test. You can't up yourself economically and pay these poll taxes. Uh, obviously, that's going to continue to keep uh, African Americans down. And you add on to it uh, violence like this, which will increase post-1877. Uh, this is going to be another uh, a big factor post-Reconstruction. So how do you change this? What do you do here? Well, black leaders are going to try to come up with a solution to this problem. Because, again, basically what's going to happen is it's going to leave blacks in sort of the not slavery, I don't want to say that, but it's going to be very hard to elevate your social position. Uh, again, there will be some black elites, some people that are going to manage to defy the odds and get uh, increased, become, uh, you know, maybe not wealthy, but uh, uh, achieve some sort of wealth, education, things like that. But for the majority, it's going to be incredibly difficult. How do you get around this? Well, black leaders will come up with a number of different solutions. We'll have guys like Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass He'd been a slave before the Civil War. He actually escaped slavery, made his way north. When He uh, he was one of the few slaves that had learned to read and write. His master's uh, uh, wife had taught him how to read and write. Um, well, he gets he escapes slavery, comes north, starts making these speeches, um, writes a couple books. Uh, he's going to become a prolific speech. He's, he's going to become a friend of Abraham Lincoln. He's going to be one of the guys that's pushing Lincoln for the Emancipation Proclamation, things like that. Well... Frederick Douglass lives past the Civil War. He lives past Reconstruction. And he's going to sort of offer this hope that maybe politics can, can be a, a solution to this. So we did have Reconstruction where there were significant gains, 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment. Maybe we can, can continue to see, see uh, reform. And he's going to basically put his hopes that the Republican Party is going to get past the things that were happening to it uh, and once again, take up the cause of African Americans. So maybe we continue because, again, you know, if you are black that can vote, you're going to vote for the Republican Party almost all the time because, uh, you know, even if they're going to start looking past these reform issues, it's better than Democrats. So Douglas is going to hope that Republican part, uh, Party can uh, pick up from things. Well, as Douglas is going to find out, vast majority of Republicans are going to start to sort of shy away from continued reform. Most Republicans around this time, we're going to talk about this more later, will start focusing on the pro-business aspect of their party. So we've done enough in reform. Let's start work on growing the American economy, helping American business. That's what the Republican Party's about now. The reform-minded Republicans, a lot of them are going to want to make continued reform uh, to help blacks in the South to improve the situation. But a lot of these guys are going to be hampered by the fact that if they try to push for reform for blacks, this is going to, to uh, deter their efforts or hinder their efforts to make other reforms. We're going to talk about a guy later uh, named uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Republican, reform-minded Republican. He had a ton of ideas to change and improve the United States, one of which was an anti-lynching law. He wanted to put in place a law that made it to where um, uh, blacks would be accused of certain crimes, would be transferred to a different county to prevent people from lynching them before they could receive trial. Well, the thing is, Roosevelt, that's but one of multiple things he had he wanted to do. Let's make for the sake of uh, argument here, let's say 20 things he wants to do. One of these is lynching. Well, what Roosevelt's going to quickly discover is that Southerners, if you talk anything about making reform for blacks, you can forget about their support on your other issues. So Teddy Roosevelt, reform-minded, he looks around and says, I got 20 things I want to do. If I focus on this one, I'm not going to get any support from the Democrats on these 19 other issues. So I have to make a choice here. Um, I'm going to either have to choose this or my 19 other issues. And the vast, vast majority of Republicans are going to say it's better to just drop the issues for African Americans and focus on the other things. As a matter of fact, it's right around this time that you see this term Solid South come around. Solid South means that the South will vote together, and they're almost always going to vote against uh, reforms for uh, blacks. If you mention civil rights reforms, then uh, you can basically give up on giving, getting support from the South for anything else. So Frederick Douglass's approach, I mean, it, it work 
if there, the situation wasn't the same. But as you're going to see, a, a lot of Republican politicians have moved on and others are too afraid to address this for fear that they uh, won't get support from Southerners on their other issues. Well, another guy that's going to come around in, in the late 1800s is going to be this guy, Booker T. Washington. How do we improve the situation for blacks in the South? Booker T. Washington, brief uh, uh, bio on him. He is a, he was born a slave before the war. Uh, after the war, he uh, he's going to be uh, uh, one of the blacks that's going to be able to go to a school uh, during Reconstruction, the school called Hampton School. Uh, he's going to excel there, going to uh, outperform just about everybody. Part of the reason he, he's going to do this is because Booker T. Washington's what you would probably refer to as a workaholic. He worked all hours of the day, constantly educating himself, just saw it as, you know, this is what you're supposed to do to uh, make your way in, in the world and work all the time. Superhuman in his work ethic, you know, uh, more than, than most of us. Well, uh, he's going to work his way up. He's eventually going to start teaching at a school called the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. This has initially been set up as recon during Reconstruction. It's going to continue after Reconstruction for elite blacks. Uh, he's going to start teaching there. Eventually, he's going to take over the head of this Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. When he takes over the Tuskegee Institute, it's basically going to become the preeminent black school in the South. Again, you know, we, we have some black schools that, uh, 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 especially for higher education facilities for elite blacks, but they, they're going to be... Uh, uh, fewer number than we're going to see the the white schools. Uh, but when he takes over the Tuskegee Institute, he's going to start teaching his students to be non-confrontational. So the way that we get reform is not to protest things like the lynching laws, things like that. Instead, Washington's going to argue that in order for African Americans to make their way in society, they basically got to work twice as hard as whites and earn their civil rights, you know, uh, show them that we're deserving of civil rights. He'll be pushing things like uh, education and mechanics, uh, engineering, that type of thing. Uh, also sort of manual uh, labor uh, type jobs, but excelling at them to show that we're deserving of, uh, deserving of our rights. Well, Booker T. Washington uh, is going to start making these arguments and um, uh, and and uh, he's going to become this prominent speaker for black Americans uh, in, in pushing uh, for these reforms in society. Well, some people are going to come along and they're going to question Booker T. Washington's approach. They'll say, sure, it worked for you, but you're not like everybody. Not everybody can work as hard as you. Not everybody's as smart as you. What about out of average Joe Schmo? You know, should he have to earn his civil rights? You know, and that's going to be the other thing is, why should one person have to work twice as hard as the next person when the 14th Amendment says you're guaranteed equal protection under the law? Shouldn't we be provided it because if something's provided by the government uh, to whites, it should be provided to blacks as well? So some people are going to criticize them because uh, for these reasons. Others are going to criticize, yeah, that's true what you're saying. If you work hard, maybe you can uh, achieve something. But couldn't that easily be taken away from you? Let's say you're a black store owner and you start working harder than this white store owner down the street. You start uh, working twice as hard. You put your, um, you know, uh, uh, you, you uh, sell groceries cheaper and you're able to cut the cost because you're working harder than them and your store starts to do much better than theirs. Well, this store owner could then hire somebody to burn down your store and he's probably going to get away with it because he knows the sheriff well now your store's burned down this guy's doing well you work twice as hard as him now you have nothing his store's doing fine and the government supporting him is not supporting you so yes you're right you can work hard maybe you can achieve something but then it could easily be taken away unless there's a fundamental change at the top so again his approach might have some uh, validity to it but there's going to be some people that uh, are going to criticize him. And one of the people that's going to criticize him is going to be a guy named W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, du Bois will come out uh, of the North. So Booker T. Washington's from the South. Du Bois is actually born to um, a family that uh, of, of Northern blacks. They had earned their freedom long before the Civil War, before the, the uh, American Revolution. Uh, they'd been multiple generations free. Well, W.E.B. Du Bois is going to... Uh, become the first uh, black man to receive his Ph.D. at Harvard, which he does in the 1890s. Uh, and while he's there, he's going to start writing, researching black history. 
and Du Bois is going to come up with a theory that basically is going to be an almost direct opposition to Booker T. Washington. So, so Washington, non-confrontational, worked twice as hard as whites. Du Bois is going to say, I don't think that's the way to do things. I think you should be confrontational. Nobody's going to change in anything if you're going along with the system. They're only going to change if you push back against the system. So he's going to say, we need to directly challenge these laws. We need to call our politicians out on these things. We need to protest. We need to do things to bring attention to the causes because this is the only way the change is going to come about. Du Bois is also going to push for the creation of a black elite. Basically, he's going to call for something called the talented tenth. He, he'll say that let's take the most educated, the uh, most talented blacks, and let's all support one another, and let's then create this black elite, which can then provide for the rest of the blacks. So the whites have the white elite. Um, let's create a black elite, and these blacks can then serve the black community. And then when they gain the wealth from the black community, they can then use this to support reform. So he's going to push for sort of this black elite to start making, uh, pushing for reformers for the uh, 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 for lower class blacks. So call for sort of this talent and tenth. And as part of this, uh, uh, Du Bois is going to be one of these inaugural members of this NAACP, which we'll talk about later, which is going to be sort of, at least the way it's going to start out as sort of this elite black organization that will start pushing for black rights. So Du Bois' idea, con be confrontational, support this sort of, uh, this elite black class, and there is going to be some validity to this, and as we're going to see, this approach will eventually start working. The problem with it is, though, you can be confrontational where Du Bois is. So he was in Massachusetts. That's where Harvard was, or Harvard is. Um, so he can be confrontational there. Can Booker T. Washington say the same thing Du Bois says in Alabama when you have things like uh, what happened to Henry Smith in Texas happened in Alabama all the time? Can you do that? Can you challenge laws down there uh, without fear of death, without uh, you know fear that your everything you have is going to be taken away? So his approach makes some sense, but but just like the other approaches, it's going to have problems as well. So what this is going to basically mean is that by the end of Reconstruction, we're going to have this situation where blacks in the South, situation is vastly improved since 1865. Slavery is over. People can't sell your children. That's gone, and there's not, I mean, that's great. There, there's Whatever happens, it's not uh, as bad as slavery. 13th Amendment got rid of slavery. But the thing is, the 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection law. The 15th Amendment, you can't take away the right to vote based on race, color, previous servitude. Even though those are on the books, when white Southern Democrats get back in charge, there's found ways to subvert it. So what this means is that, sure, you're not slaves more anymore, but getting out of this manual labor class, getting property, improving yourself economically, socially, it's very, very difficult still. Is it better than slavery? Yes. But is it an ideal? No. And actually what we're going to see most uh, blacks in the South, they're going to end up in the same type of situation they were before, except for instead of being property, they'll probably end up being tenant farmers to uh, uh, to these landowners where you don't own any property and basically you have to give a portion of what you produce to the landowner. We'll talk about that a lot more later. But if you were to uh, be asked, is Reconstruction a success or failure? It, I don't know, okay? Uh, it's not going to be, it's going to be good for one generation of blacks, those who, who got power from 67 uh, to 77, and a little bit beyond. We're going to see some black politicians stay in power beyond that. And again, slavery's over, but the situation doesn't improve significantly, and it's certainly not going to be equal, uh, at least not for a very long time. So it's up to you whether or not uh, if you think Reconstruction was a failure or not.